Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 93 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for eh, basically the first week of February 2013. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next eh, almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Um, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, tidbits, suggestions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. In fact, they should be sent to me directly. Don't bother CCAT with it. It's it's me you, you want to talk to. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you do send me email, though, I just have two requests. One, please be a little patient. I can sometimes be a little slow about answering my email, but I do answer it. And uh, two, please, in the subject line, include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show, something so that I know it's not spam, all right? With those, by now, traditional introductions out of the way, let's get to it. I'm going to start, as I always like to do when the opportunity arises, to start with some good news. Uh, a civil unions bill that would allow same-sex couples in the state of Colorado to enjoy uh, much of the same rights that married couples do has actually passed out of a Senate committee. It's the first of several steps this bill will have to go through in order to be passed out of the legislature. But the reason then this is really good news, uh, well, there are two things. One is that according to uh, an outfit called Public Policy Polling, this is a survey they did last August, 57% of people in Colorado approve of same-sex unions, uh, of same-sex civil unions, including, in fact, a third of Republicans. And the, uh, the bill, this bill has overwhelming support among the Democrats who are the majority in the legislature in Colorado. And even some support among the goppers. In fact, there's one Republican who's a co-sponsor of the bill in the House. And the bill is expected to get over all these hurdles and pass. And when it does, Governor John Hickenlooper has already said more than once that he'll sign it. So this looks like it's a pretty much a done deal, just getting it, you know, the, the details. Now, the possibility of a legal battle on this still looms, however, because Colorado's state constitution is still one of those that defines marriage as one man and one woman. And it would seem entirely logical to think that the, uh, the right-wingers are going to try to block this law, claiming it's some unconstitutional violation of the clear intent of that constitutional provision. Now, such a suit isn't particularly likely to succeed. Uh, courts have generally recognized that there is a legal distinction between civil unions and marriage. So again, it's unlikely to succeed. That doesn't mean the dead enders won't try it anyway. Um, and the upside of this is that this whole business may actually spur Coloradans to reconsider that constitutional ban. Uh, that may especially be so if uh, the U.S. Supreme Court overturns California's Proposition 8, or as it became known, Prop 8. Now, there is an important difference here that needs to be noted. Uh, Proposition 8 actually stripped away rights to same-sex marriage that had previously existed, as opposed to blocking them in the first place. So there is a legal difference. But still... It's likely true, as uh, Colorado State Senator Pat Stedman says, that uh, Colorado's uh, amendment barring same-sex marriages will not stand the test of time. When this passes, Colorado will become the sixth state to approve civil unions. Currently, nine states and the District of Columbia allow for same-sex marriage, and three states have pending same-sex marriage bills. So if they all pass, it would be 18 states and the District of Columbia. Now, there is uh, a, second effect, a second bit of good news that's sort of a footnote to this one. Apparently, the Boy Scouts of America uh, are going to be changing. It's going to be changing its policy of rejecting members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual, or as it's known, the LGBT community. Just last year, the Scouts emphatically reaffirmed, and that's quote, uh, the policy of excluding gays as both Scouts and as Scout leaders. But in the face of increasing public outrage and the accelerating loss of support from corporations, the United Way, and local governments, the outfit has apparently decided that, yes, discretion is indeed the better part of valor, 
and is about to announce a revised policy that will lift the ban on gay participants in the national standards uh, and allow local sponsoring organizations to decide whether or not they will admit gay participants. Now, the second part of that sort of takes back a good part of the first since it still allows local scout troops to discriminate, but it is still a real step in the right direction, which means like into the 21st century. You know, the fact, too, this comes just days after a Boy Scout troop, uh, I'm sorry, a Cub Scout pack in Maryland. They had issued a, a, dis a non-discrimination statement that included sexual orientation. This is approved overwhelmingly by the parents involved. The National Boy Scout Office forced them to take that down. The fact that this change, this news about the change, comes just days after that happened adds a little extra piquancy to the to the news as I keep saying this this is one area this is one area where that long moral arc of the universe is unquestionably bending toward justice all right from there we're going to go to our regular weekly feature the clown award given for acts of meritorious stupidity I have to tell you, this week I was tempted to make this one the outrage of the week, but I ultimately decided that it is so stupid that uh, it really does belong here, so you might think of it as the Evil Clown Award. In any event, the big red nose this week goes to New Mexico State Representative Catherine Brown. She's a Republican, duh. This twit, who apparently looks for a train of logic ten minutes after it left the station, introduced a bill that would effectively require women who were raped or victims of incest who became pregnant as a result would force them to carry their pregnancies to term in order to use the fetus as evidence in a trial for sexual assault. A rape victim or an incest victim who ended her pregnancy could face up to three years in prison on a felony charge of tampering with evidence. This is, I'm going to quote the bill. This is the actual words. Tampering with evidence shall include procuring or facilitating an abortion or compelling or coercing another to obtain an abortion of a fetus that is a result of criminal sexual penetration or incest with the intent to destroy evidence of the crime. Brown said that her intent was to protect women. But as uh, uh, Pat Davis of Progress Now New Mexico said, it really means that victims who are legitimately raped will have to carry the fetus to term uh, in order to prove their case. Now the upside of this and why it's the clown and not the outrage is that the bill is regarded as very unlikely to pass. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that um, Catherine Brown, <laughs> you're a clown. All right, now there's sort of a, a sort of a footnote to this again on I'd say um, uh, uh, sort of related. This, in fact, we actually are talking about abortion and abortion rights here. Uh, it's a sort of related item. On New Year's Day, 2006, Lori Stodgill, she was seven month pregnant with uh, pregnant with twins. She arrived at St. Thomas More Hospital in Canyon City, Colorado. Turned out she was having a massive heart attack. Her obstetrician, his name is Dr. Pelham Staples, he, besides being her obstetrician, he was the obstetrician on call for emergencies that night. He never answered his page. Lori Stodgill died less than an hour after she arrived at the hospital. Her twin fetuses died with her. Her husband, Jeremy, filed a wrongful death suit against Dr. Staples, arguing he should have made it to the hospital, or at least he should have formed the ER staff to perform a C-section, which wouldn't have saved Lori, but it would have given birth to the twins. Maybe they would have been saved. The lead defendant in this case is Catholic Health Initiatives. It's a hospital conglomerate that uh, runs not only St. Thomas More, but also about 170 other health facilities in 17 states. Its mission, according to its own literature, is to nurture the healing ministry of the church and to be guided by fidelity to the gospel based on the moral directives of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. But when it came to mounting a defense in this case, the corporation's lawyers are arguing that the court, I'm going to quote the brief, 
The court should not overturn the long-standing rule in Colorado that the term person, as is used in the Wrongful Death Act, encompasses only individuals born alive. Colorado state courts define person under the act to include only those born alive. Therefore, plaintiffs cannot maintain wrongful death claims based on two unborn fetuses. Now, the truth is that may be legally correct in Colorado. In fact, uh, um, Catholic Health Initiatives has one in lower court. But the idea of this Catholic institution, this Catholic institution claiming fealty to the, the conference of US Catholic bishops, the idea of this Catholic institution in essence going, fetuses are unborn children, save the unborn children, protect the unborn children, except if it's gonna cost us money. That notion, that gross rancid hypocrisy, it just stinks to, well, to high heaven. All right, one more thing before we, before we take a break here. Our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Uh, it's gonna be sort of short and to the point this week, but um, certainly not sweet. Last year, Senate Majority Leader Harry the Wimp Reed uh, thought he had a deal with Senate Republican leader Mitch Fishface McConnell to limit the use of filibusters. Now McConnell, to no one's surprise except apparently Reed's, burned him on the deal. Reed wound up apologizing to members of his caucus who had been urging him to rewrite Senate rules to restrict the filibuster, particularly to get rid of the so-called silent filibuster. This is where a single member of the Senate can hold up action on a bill unless there are 60 votes to overcome their objection without even having to publicly acknowledge they're the one causing the delay. Reed said at that time, and he said again after the election, that he was going to see the rules changed in the new Congress. Well, the moment came, and as what should have been a surprise to no one, Reed wimped out. He had by all but universal agreement the 51 votes, the majority he needed to get through real changes to the rules. But instead, he opted for another gentleman's agreement with McDonald. Uh, McConnell, rather, um, having apparently never heard the admonition, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Now, the deal made some minor changes to filibuster rules, but uh, left them largely unchanged. Um, the silent filibuster is, is virtually intact, and the 60-volt threshold to actually get a bill passed is untouched. In other words, it does pretty much nothing. But don't tell that to the dummycrats. Every one of them voted for the thing when it finally came to the floor. Claire McCaskill said, it's compromise, I'm big on that. She also called it progress, said we're starting on the right foot. Carl Levin rather bizarrely remarked that this will give great momentum to working on a bipartisan basis, just the way it has before. And Dick Durbin said the deal established a very positive environment to start this session, while at the same time saying he didn't know if it would make it any easier to pass any bills. Oh, well, it can, he said. It requires goodwill and good faith. Did it ever occur to him that there was some supply of goodwill and good faith? This whole discussion would have been unnecessary. We are governed by fanatics on one side and wimps and idiots on the other. It is an outrage. And we're going to take a break. Hi, we're back. Uh, for the rest of the show, we're going to talk about guns. I said before, I'm probably going to be talking about guns in some part of a show, probably at least another two weeks after this. We'll see. But uh, we are going to talk about guns. You know, two weeks ago, when I started this, two weeks ago, I, I started actually by expressing my anger and frustration at the fact that this is, even, this is actually before, it was the day of, and it hadn't been happened yet, the day of that Obama was going to announce his gun control proposals and which I didn't know what they were yet, because uh, they weren't out yet, but um, 
I expressed my frustration at the fact that even then, at that point, that uh, some gun control uh, advocate groups and members of Congress uh, were already going on, well, we're not really getting anything done. Eh, maybe we'll get a little bit more. They were engaging in what I call preemptive capitulation. They were giving up before the battle had even started. So last week, I was, you know, pleasantly surprised by Obama's proposals. They uh, were not radical by any, by any means, but um, they were pretty, you know, like wide-reaching, pretty much encompassed a lot of aspects of this. Now it's this week. And this week, what do we have? Well, we have the great Mr. O telling advocates for intelligent policy that it's up to us to bridge the cultural gap between urban and rural people on the issue, and how, quoting him, advocates of gun control have to do a little more listening than they do sometimes. In other words, it's time for another national conversation. We, we who believe that the answer to gun violence is not more gun violence, we who believe that the answer to too many guns is not more guns, we have to listen more. For, for years, for decades now, almost the entire public conversation, if you can even call it that, almost the entire public conversation has consisted of the right wing screeching about how guns equal freedom and gun control, any gun control at all, is the same as confiscation and tyranny, and about how the gun-loving patriots, who to them are apparently the only kind of patriot, the gun-loving patriots are constantly under threat and constantly under attack, and all of their mewling and whining about how threatened they are, apparently with the whoop-whoop of the black helicopters flying in the background. But we have to listen more. Just in the past couple of weeks, we've had a viral video of an ex-Marine excuse me, Marine veteran, you're never an ex-Marine. We had this viral video of this Marine uh, who referred to Senator Dianne Feinstein's uh, proposal to reinstate the ban on assault weapons by saying that he was gonna, not going to allow some woman to tell him he couldn't have his toys. We had Tim Donnelly a member of the California Assembly who said that, uh, that guns are, I'm quoting, essential to living the way God intended. We had Jesse Benton. Now, he's the campaign director for Fish Face McConnell. Uh, he sent out a fund appeal on McConnell's behalf with the salutation, Dear Patriot, and declaring, these are all quotes, you and I are literally surrounded by the gun grabbers who are about to launch an all-out assault on the Second Amendment, on your rights, on your freedom. But we have to listen more. We've had Marion Hammer, a former president of the Nutsoid Rabbit Brains of America, the NRA, who said, who said that gun control is the same, and he meant the same as racism banning guns by their appearance, and he actually said by their color. Now, speaking of the NRA, we have it sending out a fund appeal letter uh, claiming that Obama had, this is a quote, pledged to raise $20 million to ram his gun ban agenda through Congress as part of an all-out crusade to ban your guns and abolish every last sacred right you have under the Second Amendment until they reduce your freedom to ashes. By the way, there's absolutely no such evidence of this $20 million fundraising deal, and when it was asked for evidence of it, the NRA couldn't supply any. But we have to listen more. We have had shades of the 1850s, legislative efforts in Mississippi to declare that, uh, any, that the state can simply ignore any federal gun law, or in fact any other federal law, it doesn't feel like enforcing. We've seen legislative efforts in Texas and Wyoming to make it a felony to enforce federal gun bans on uh, assault, rifle, assault rifles or high-capacity gun magazines in the state, and the one in Wyoming may actually pass. But we have to listen more. We had Neil Heslin, just this week, we had Neil Heslin. He is the father of a six-year-old boy who was killed in the Sandy Hook massacre. We had him heckled by dozens of gun nuts while he testified about his son before a Senate panel in Connecticut. 
We had this guy, James Yeager, and he's the CEO of this outfit called, uh, out in Tennessee it is, it's called Tactical Response. It claims to specialize in weapons and tactical training. We had him posting a video in which he quite literally, and in so many words, threatens to start killing people if it, that is gun control, if it goes one inch further. Now, first off, what further is he talking about? Further implies there has been increasing gun control over the years. What is he, what is he just ticked off? He can't have his own bazooka and, and rocket launcher? Oh, no, 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 but he said one inch further, one inch further. If there were any moves to gun control, he said, it would spark a civil war and he would be glad to fire the first shot. And we had this. This is the front page of the Drudge Report for January 9th. Now, the Drudge Report is this collection of, 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 of right-wing scandal mongering. Uh, in case you've never heard of it, it made a name for itself uh, when it got some scoop or another during the Monica Lewinsky business. As a result of this, the right-wing media, by which I mean people like Limbaugh and Hannity and Fox News and the rest, they started using the Drudge Report and promoting it. And disgustingly, the mainstream media, apparently afraid of being scooped again, started to let the Drudge Report drive what would be covered and how it would be covered. Now, happily, that very last part, that has faded. But the Drudge Report is still around, still a source for the right-wing. And it presents us with things like this. And just in case, I want to make sure, just in case you can't make that out, I'm going to make sure that you know what it is. The headline says, White House threatens executive orders on guns, illustrated with pictures of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. That's what we hear. That's what's being said. That's what we're being told. But now we're being told that the real problem is that we are the ones who haven't reached out. We are the ones who haven't tried to understand. We are the ones who haven't listened enough. Well, bull. We have done nothing but listen for years now. But, but I want to tell you, Mr. President, yeah, I know about that cultural divide. I do. I know all about it. I still remember reading years ago the insightful comment, and I don't remember the source. It was a syndicated column. I think it was William Raspberry, but don't hold me to that. But I heard an insightful comment that one of the reasons gun control is such a divisive issue is that for urban people, the concept guns means violent crime, where for a lot of rural people, the concept guns means hunting, target shooting, and pest control. But here's some, which actually, that, that itself, that brings up something else. It brings up something else to show you how far things have moved. That quote came from the early 1980s. This is the time when there was actually, seriously, a conversation about the possibility of banning handguns. There was actually a group, the National Coalition to Ban Handguns. And their agenda was that only people like police and specially trained security guards and some other people who could show a need for such guns should have access to them. How much has the conversation shifted since then? So much so that the idea of banning handguns is so far off the table, it seems weird. And even the organization has not only given up on the idea, they've given up on the name. It's now called the National Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. But getting back to that cultural divide, this cultural divide will not be solved by us listening more. Because frankly, we already know about it. We've already heard about it. We've been told over and over again about the family traditions, the male bonding outings uh, for hunting. And we already know about how hunting, how target shooting, how clay pigeon shooting, uh, it's, all, it's part of a, a life for rural America. Indeed, we know how that for some people, this, their, the, the, the success of their fall hunt determines how well they'll eat over the course of the winter. We know that. Frankly, if that divide is to be overcome, we're not the ones who have to listen more. It will require that other side to do more of the listening. It will require them to understand, to sense, to feel, to identify with the daily carnage that guns bring to cities across this country. It will require them to listen long enough to understand and answer our questions about why their family tradition of hunting requires an AR-15 and a 100-round magazine. Why pest control has to require a massive firepower instead of an old-fashioned single-action 22 rifle. And why their target shooting has to be done with like a, a Glock instead of a pellet gun. 
Most importantly, it required those rural folks to stop letting people, the paranoids like the NRA, like James Jaeger and, and Tim Donnelly, and the bozos like Fishface McConnell speak for them. Most importantly, it will require them to admit, contrary to what they're being told, they are on the short side of public debate. We are the majority. Poll after poll, all from this month, Washington Post, ABC News, 58% support a ban on assault rifles, 88% require background checks for guns, 76% for ammunition. CBS News, 57% uh, support stronger gun laws, an 18% increase, 18 percentage point increase since April. U.S. Today Gallup, 58% support stronger laws, 15 points above a year before. CNN ORC, 62% of Americans ban on assault weapons. 95% think all gun purchases should be subject to background checks. The Pew Center on People and the Press, 85% make all gun sales subject to background checks. Two-thirds favor a federal database to track gun sales. Clear majorities favor banning assault-style weapons, high-capacity ammunition clips, and the sale of ammunition online. By nearly three to two, Americans oppose the idea of arming teachers and school officials. And on what may be the ultimate question, when actually asked which is more important, controlling gun ownership or protecting gun rights, a majority, a small majority, but still a majority, went for the former. The fact is, we are the majority. We are the majority, and it's about time we started acting like it. So frankly, I'm tired of listening. We've been listening for years. I'm tired of the silence on this side of the argument, and I'm tired, frankly, of my contribution to that silence. I'm tired of liberal guilt, the notion that every time there is a social conflict, it's because the left has not tried hard enough for accommodation, because the left has offer, not offered enough compromise, because we haven't been understanding enough, because we haven't listened enough. I have no interest in that, I have no time for that, and I'm not going to be distracted by that, especially when there is still some sanity. That guy James Yeager who threatened to kill people, <laughs> The state of Tennessee suspended his gun license on the basis of a material likelihood of threat of harm to the public. Sometimes poetic justice is the only kind you get, but it is a form of justice. And um, we'll see you next week. You have the best week you can.